This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History, and we are in the middle of an Ashes series at the moment, one of the most hallowed institutions in world sport. And so what better person to talk to about this than former Australian captain Greg Chappell. Greg, thanks for joining us on the podcast. My pleasure, Matt. Uh, Nice to be with you. Now, you grew up in South Australia and your grandfather was the great Victor Richardson, a bit of a hero of mine, and he must be one of the great all-round sportsmen that Australia has ever produced. Not only did he captain Australia in the cricket, he was a great Aussie rules player. I believe he represented Australia in baseball. He was an accomplished golfer. He must have been a huge influence on your young life growing up in South Australia. Yes, he was. Um, but funnily enough, I mean, we I probably became more aware of you know his achievements much later. I mean, he was very, uh, very humble and very quiet. Um, you know, he, he didn't have a huge involvement in our day to day life, particularly our sporting life. You know, our father was probably the more important one as far as our sport and particularly our cricket was concerned. And, you know, looking back on it, I think Vic probably you know, he'd had enough of his own sport um, and enough of his own cricket. He probably didn't feel he needed to spend time trying to coach another generation of cricketers. And he knew that our father had things well in hand. So Vic was, um, you know, at arm's length from us um, as we grew up. I can remember once as a nearly five-year-old, I stayed at his place when our, when my younger brother Trevor was born. Um, mum was obviously in hospital. Dad uh, probably didn't have the time uh, because of work to do the, all the domestic duties. So I was certainly farmed out to um, my grandfather's place. And Vic had a, a place at um, Westbourne Park in Adelaide, uh, which was a corner block. He'd obviously bought three blocks. So the house was on the corner. Uh, one of the side blocks was a tennis court and the other side block was a... Um, yeah, you know, it was a garden basically with fruit trees and and so on. But up in one corner, he had a turf pitch. So I obviously discovered the turf pitch, and I dragged him out one day and and made him bowl to me as an almost five year old. And that's really the only time that I can remember him directly being involved in our cricket. But as we grew up, he was very supportive. Um, he would come to our school cricket uh, when I was playing schoolboy cricket he would never actually come to the ground itself and again when I look back on it I think it was probably because he knew that if he turned up that would become an event in its own right and the distraction away from our cricket so what he tended to do was park down the road and you know sometimes I'd be batting at the front oval at at school and I'd look down the road and I'd see the big black car parked you know, half a kilometre down the road and I'd just keep looking and every now and then a head would poke out from behind a tree and and then disappear again and then next thing I look up and he's the car's gone. Uh, and maybe if I'd had a good day that night, the phone would ring at home and mum generally answered the phone and, um, you know, she'd say, it's pop, uh, your grandfather on the, on the phone and I'd go to the phone, hello, he'd say, well done, clunk, the phone would go down and that was the end of the conversation. So he... Uh, yeah, you know, he got to see. He certainly got to see Ian play Test cricket. Um, he died in 1969, so I didn't start playing until Test cricket till 1970. But he had at least seen me play some first class cricket um, before he passed away. Now, Greg, you grew up in a very sporting family, and obviously cricket was was in the blood. What what did it mean to you as a young bloke? What what did the Ashes mean as a young bloke when you were learning your trade, first beginning to play, um, playing with your brothers? It must have been something that was always significant in your family. Yes, it was. Um, I was aware of test cricket from a very early age, and it always seemed to be Ashes test cricket. We used to play cricket in the backyard. Ian's five years older, and, and it was probably, I reckon I was nine before he even recognised that I was alive because he had mates of his own age that he wanted to play with. You know, he didn't want to play with a brother who was five years younger, but Obviously, he ran out of friends about the time I was nine years of age, um, and all of a sudden, I was seconded into the the test matches in the backyard, and they were always Ashes test matches. Um, The bad news for me was that Ian, as the older brother, was Australia, and I had to be England, so my first experience of Ashes test cricket was as a POM, so uh, that was a real challenge for me because whilst I didn't want to be beaten by my older brother, I didn't really have my heart in playing for England and winning for England. So um, I had to suck that up and learn to compete. And when I look back on it again, I realised that 
a lot of the lessons that I learned in that backyard were so important in the process of me as in developing as the the cricketer I became because I was smaller, I was younger, I was weaker, I was out gun from the start. So I had to learn to compete. I had to learn coping skills. I had to learn to, you know, just keep up as best I could. And whether he did it knowingly, probably not, but the fact that Ian treated me as an equal and made me have to compete was a really important part in my development. And, you know, our father insisted that whenever we played cricket, we played seriously. He insisted we played with a hard ball so and gave us no pads and gloves to play with. So, you know, he wanted us to find out what a hard ball felt like. Well, I found out quite a bit what a hard ball felt like because Ian didn't hold back. <laughs> well, it obviously worked. Yes. Um, the, talking about the, the Ashes series, and we mentioned Victor Richardson, and he played in the Bodyline series in 1932-33, probably one of the most famous yeah. historic Ashes series. How, as a, as a cricketer, as, as a, later as a professional cricketer, as a captain, how how did you look back on that series? Because the the the, the tactic of the short pitch bowling, the the leg side field was later banned. It was legal at the time. But but looking back on that, do you think England were justified in those tactics? Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, uh, you know they had a situation where Bradman had just been making runs for fun, and um, you know he came to Australia as as captain with a with a plan, and uh, it was legal. Uh, it wasn't. People didn't enjoy it very much, um, but you know, I, I, as a captain, I can absolutely understand where where he was coming from um, and why he used Larwood in the manner that he did. Um, because you know, somehow he had to curb the runs that Bradman made if they were going to make um, if they were going to win the win the series. So, you know, I I don't really understand what all the the angst was was about. Um, he had a job to do and he tried to do it to the best of his ability. You played in 35 Ashes Tests, I think it was, over your career. Just for those of us who haven't played cricket at the top level, just explain to us what it means, the significance of playing in the Ashes. To to us mugs out there watching it, it's the it's the epitome of, of cricket. It, it must be the same for the players as well. Yes, I mean, growing up in a sporting family, but, you know, all my mates, all my you know, school friends, um, anyone who, who played cricket in that era, you know, dreamt of playing test cricket for Australia and and we dreamt of playing against England. I mean, I can remember as a youngster lying in bed at night listening on the the radio, you know, with the transistor radio under the pillow um, so that I could wake up, um, you know, in the middle of the night and, you know, hear the the scores. And hearing the the sound of test cricket coming down the radio waves was was quite something for me um, because, as I say, I, I dreamt one day doing it. But I don't know that I ever really thought that, it would happen. It was just something that all of us did. All my mates um, dreamt of it. I don't know that I ever really thought that it would happen. Um, and it was probably, again, good luck for me that I had an older brother who was that step ahead of me. And so I would have been 13 when Ian first played for South Australia. And so that was the first time that I thought, whoa, hang on, you know, if he can do that, maybe I can do that. And then when he got to play test cricket, I would have been 16. Um, and so that was another spur to think, well, you know, maybe this is more real than I, than I think it is. So, uh, that, that was always great encouragement, uh, for me, but those memories of listening is something different about listening to cricket on the radio than watching it on television. I think because you haven't got the pictures, the, the commentators are sort of building word pictures for you and, you know, your imagination is doing the rest. And I, I have a great belief that imagination is a very important part of being good at something. And, um, you know, most of the, the good cricketers that I've met and that I know and that I've spoken to, you know, they all grew up playing their own little backyard games, you know, and in their mind – they were real games. And I know that when we were playing those test matches in the backyard, they were real games in our mind. They were real test matches. So we were making decisions in real time. And that's that's important in that development process. You know, batting in the nets is not quite the same. So I think that imagination is, is really important. And the other interesting thing about that is that each ground around Australia and around the world had its own personality coming across the radio waves and they all sounded a bit different. And the two grounds that excited me listening to cricket on the radio were the Sydney Cricket Ground 
and the Lord's Cricket Ground. And I'm pleased to say that I wasn't disappointed with either of them when I got to play on them because they had a aura around those two grounds, which came across the radio waves all that time before. But then as an adult, when I got to play on them, I, I wasn't disappointed. So it says a bit about the commentators too, just how good they were at painting those word pictures. What was that first Ashes moment like when you ran out on the field in your first Ashes test? Well, it was a bit surreal. Um, as I say, you know, whilst I dreamt of playing, I don't know that I ever really thought it would, would happen. And it was a different era, obviously, because, I mean, we didn't, um, we didn't have much contact with selectors. We didn't have much contact with um, the cricket board. You know, I found out about my selection um, through a phone call from one of the administrators at South Australian Cricket who rang me up to say he just heard it on the radio. So that was sort of the, that was how I found out I was playing. In fact, um, we were at the airport and he came up to me at the airport. Um, we, we were going to Perth, I think, to play a Sheffield Shield match and he, um, he came up to me. He'd just heard it on the radio in the car coming to the airport. At that point, uh, I hadn't, hadn't heard it. So that was strange. Um, then um, I got to Brisbane, which was the first test of the series in the – 71, 70, 71 series against um, Ray Lingworth, England. Um, somebody, and I don't recall who, handed me a, a bag with a baggy green cap and a sweater in it. The rest of the cricket equipment and cricket clothing we had to provide ourselves. Um, and on the morning, well, I got a bit of an inkling on the day before the first test match. Bill Laurie was captain of Australia and we were training at the Gabba in those days, the Gabba nets were on the the Gabba proper. So we had a morning training session of the Gabba in November. It was pretty hot and steamy. And we were having a team lunch after the, the training session, sort of a pre-test match lunch, uh, which the captain was obviously going to tell us what was, was happening. I knew that I was in a bit of a battle with Terry Jenner, a leg spinner from South Australia, formerly Western Australia, as to who would be 12th man. And in those days you found out who was 12th man 20 minutes before the start of play on the, the morning of the, the test match. But at this lunch, uh, I was obviously pretty hungry because I, I wasn't a big breakfast eater in those days. So I'd probably gone to training without much to eat. So after a few hours in the hot, sweaty sun in Brisbane, I was ready for food. So we, we lined up at the, um, the, the Queensland Cricketers Club. The old Cricketers Club used to be on the edge of the ground at ground level. And a table had been set up on the veranda. I was one of the first there, and interestingly enough, sitting up, sitting down opposite me was Terry Jenner, and one of the waiters put a basket of bread rolls on the table in front of us, and I reached out, obviously wanted something to eat, reached out to get a, a bread roll at the same time that Terry tried to stab one with a fork, and he took a chunk out of the back of my hand, and I said something along the lines of, oh, be careful, Terry, I've got to play cricket tomorrow, at which point Bill Laurie was just sitting down alongside me and he said, I wouldn't worry about it if I was you. So it didn't come <laughs> as any great surprise at 20 to 11 the next morning when he tapped me on the shoulder to um, tell me I was 12th man. So in some ways that was a blessing. I think it gave me a chance to experience an Ashes test match, or any test match, as 12th man before I actually got to play in one, which happened in the second test of the series in Perth. And over your career, what are the, some of those moments that stand out, those great moments uh, during Ashes tests? Well, I think, you know, walking out on the ground uh, for the first time, I can remember being in a bit of a fog um, for, a, for a bit of time during that um, test match because, you know, it seemed uh, a little bit unreal after all those years of, you know, having played the test matches in the, the backyard to actually be walking out in a in a real test match was um, not overwhelming, but it was certainly a, a big moment. Um, and again, I was probably lucky that um, England batted first, so I had a chance to spend some time in the field um, to get a little bit of a, a feel for the, the atmosphere of test cricket. And, and England did pretty well. Um, they got nearly 400 in that first innings of that test match, so I had plenty of time in the field to, you know, to soak up the atmosphere. And I actually, I was... I was picked as, as the all-rounder in that, that test match. I batted at number seven in my first test match and was the first change 
seam bowler. So I, I bowled 20-odd overs in that um, first innings. I uh, was fortunate enough to pick up my first test wicket, which I remember quite fondly was uh, Colin Cowdery, for whom I had batted many times in the backyard um, when I when I represented England in those backyard test matches. You know, Cowdery was one of the great England batsmen of his era. So I actually got him out caught and bowled with a slower ball um, from a first test wicket. So that sort of sticks in my mind um, quite uh, quite strongly. Um, and then when we batted, batting at number seven was quite strange for me because, I mean, all through my school days, I'd opened the batting. And in first class cricket up to that point, uh, you know, I'd batted um, sort of, you know, number four largely, occasionally number three. But, you know, I'd been a top order batsman. So it felt strange to be um, waiting for that that length of time. And it was quite um, surreal because we we didn't we didn't start very well. Um, Bill Laurie was was out without scoring. Keith Stackpole was out for not very many. Ian um, made some runs. Um, yeah, he probably got forty or fifty. Uh, Ian Redpath was his usual dogged self. And then uh, Paul Sheehan was batting at number six before me. And and luckily again for me. I I hardly had my pads on. In fact, I reckon I was still strapping on my second pad when Paul Sheehan managed to run himself out. So I'd hardly had time to sit there with the pads on and get worried and nervous about about batting. So all of a sudden I was out there. We were 107 for five from memory um, when I walked out to bat. And again... It felt surreal. I, I, again, felt like I was in a bit of a fog, didn't quite sort of really comprehend where I was and what I was doing. And England had, you know, a very good fast bowler in Jon Snow in that era, um, not quite as quick as Chopra, but um, certainly one of the quickest bowlers that I'd faced, very similar sort of action in, in that he just cruised up to the crease and it was a very strong shoulder action so the the pace actually was quite surprising but I, I took 48 minutes I think from memory to get my first run now that it didn't seem that long to me but all my family and friends who were watching it on television said it was a very long time but when I look back on it I don't think I faced a lot of bowling in that first 48 minutes firstly I think England recognised that Ian Redpath was the danger, that I wasn't the danger. So they were focused on getting him out. And he's never admitted it to me, but I reckon he tried to shield me from from the bowling at that stage, knowing full well that, you know, he had to, you know, we just had to get as close to the England score as, as possible. So it took me a long time to get off the mark, but then, you know, the, the fog sort of lifted and I realised there was a real contest on, you know, John Snow was working red path over and I thought perhaps I'd better um, start doing a bit of the heavy lifting and help help him out. Thankfully, we, um, you know, we got to build a, a big partnership, 200 uh, odd partnership that got us um, actually, you know, back in the game. And in fact, I think we finished up with a um, sizable, um, you know, maybe 40 or 50 run lead on the, the first inning. So uh, that sort of got us back into the test match, which in the end, uh, we, there was no result. So uh, I sort of got through it unscathed and more good luck than um, good management. Managed to get 100 in my first innings. What other Ashes tests stand out for you, Greg? What are the ones that will stay with you for the rest of your life? Oh, my first tour of England, Ashes tour of England. I, I'd played a couple of seasons of county cricket for Somerset. So I'd been to England before and I'd played on all the grounds. But just to walk out as an Australian player against England in England was probably the pinnacle of uh, of test cricket, particularly for a batsman. I, I think, you know, any runs that you got in England in those days were were hard-earned runs. You know, the pitches um, were a lot more uh, amenable to, to bowlers than Australian pitches. You know, the ball used to move around a lot more, not only in the air, but particularly off the pitch. You know, we didn't get a lot of seam movement in Australia. The ball didn't go sideways off the, the pitch like it did in England. So, it was a real challenge, and England always had, you know, a good bowling attack, very, very solid bowling attack. And in that era, with someone like John Snow leading their attack, you know, they were the best, you know, test attack going around in in those days. So, 
And to walk out for the first time in an Australian cap at Lords really stands out to be in that dressing room that WG Grace and Don Bradman you know, had and, and all the greats of the past had been in was something special. There was a an aura of the ghosts of the past. Um, and I think, again, that's why Sydney and, and Lords stand out to me because they're probably the only two grounds in world cricket that still have the same dressing rooms from that era, you know, from those days. And, um, you know, to think that all those great players of the past have, have graced those dressing rooms made them special. And to walk out to bat for Australia in a test match at Lords for the first time was really, you know, uh, I, I don't know that I'm that that emotional sort of person about the, the cricket, but... Um, I reckon even I had some tingles going down the spine first time walking out to bat uh, for Australia at a, at a Lord's Test match. And again, we were struggling. So um, it needed uh, needed someone to, to make some runs. And uh, I was one of the, the, the top six batsmen. And we'd lost, uh, I think we were, we'd lost two wickets for five when I went out to bat to join Ian. So, you know, again, interestingly enough, batting at the other end to Ian when we first started batting together as adults, because of that age difference, we never played any junior cricket together. It was quite strange because we'd always been opponents in the backyard. So to see him actually at the other end as a teammate was quite strange for a while. But by the time we were batting together at Lords in, in 72, it was, you know, it wasn't a strange thing to see him down the other end. And, you know, we had a, a partnership of about 80, I think, of uh, which Ian made 50 odd. So um, he did most of the, the heavy lifting there until he got out hooking. And uh, I went on to make a 100 on debut at Lord. So, again, that stands out as, uh, as a, a great memory. Um, Bob Massey had a magnificent test match on debut in that test match, 16 wickets, eight wickets in each innings. Um, it was a real bowler's test match. So, you know, to be the only one that was able to make a century in that game stands out for me as probably one of my my best innings in any test series, let alone an Ashes series. And then at the Oval, at the end of that series, Ian and I batted together for a long time. In fact, um, it was the first occasion on which brothers made a, a century in the same innings in a test match. You went on, obviously, Greg, to an illustrious career and, and, and will be remembered as one of the great captains. It's, it's been said that the two most revered jobs in Australia are the Prime Minister and the, the captain of the Australian test team. How did you deal with that? immense weight of responsibility as Australian captain, particularly during those Ashes series? Um, sometimes pretty well, sometimes not quite so well. Uh, it was a demanding role um, because there were no no coaches, um, no full-time team managers, no media managers. So as captain, you were the focal point of, of all the interest of the, you know, on, on Australian cricket. And, um, you know, it was a, a big part of our you know, of our culture and a big part of our summers in those days, you know, the cricket on the, the radio and cricket on the television was, you know, it always seemed to be on in the background. So it was a big part of, you know, most people's lives. And therefore the, the focal point for those summer months was with the Australian team and um, and that focus often centred on on the Australian captain. So it, it, it was seen as an important role and it was an important role and I, I took it as an important role. Again, I'd been lucky that I'd had Ian go before me and uh, so I'd had a close look at what was entailed in, in the captaincy and even though I had that insight, it was still a shock to realise just how big a, a role it was and, you know, how people, you know, the, the media were interested in what was going on and, I mean, I can remember getting phone calls at home at six o'clock in the morning and, you know, midnight at, uh, at the other end of the, the day um, at the hotel, someone would ring someone from the media would ring and get put through to your hotel room so you were there was no filter between you and and the outside world so it was you were often surprised you know snuck up snuck up upon uh, for comments about one thing or another you know I thought it was a big job before World Series cricket but after World Series cricket um, you know and, and Packer and Channel 9 taking over and really promoting the game in a much more vigorous way than had been the case before World Series cricket. And Ian had come back and played in World Series cricket and had been captain. So I'd had a couple of years relief from the captaincy role. 
Uh, and I was grateful for the break, to be honest, because, you know, I'd had a couple of years as captain and, and it was a big job. But after I was staggered how much, you know, it had grown, the role had grown exponentially after World Series cricket because there was much more media involved. You know, before it had been, you know, ABC radio and ABC television and and the print media. But all of a sudden, after World Series cricket, it was every radio station in Australia, anyone who had a microphone or, a, um, you know, some sort of interest in in cricket seemed to come out of the woodwork. And again, you know, we had no support. Um, as captain, I had no support, uh, no filter between me and, and whoever wanted to approach. The demands were huge, and it was probably from my experience that, and then, you know, after I retired, I went on the cricket board and Alan Border became captain after Kim Hughes. And, you know, I made the comment to the cricket board at the time that, you know, we've got to put some support around Alan to take some of this workload off him. Otherwise, he won't survive. You know, nobody would. And there aren't that many people that you, you know, you can have as as captain at any given point. So if you've got someone like Alan who you knew had the cricket now to, to be captain – and be able to cope with all of the pressures of it and still play well, then we had to have some support around him. So coaching coaches became part of the scene. Um, full-time team managers beca- became part of the, the scene and media managers became part of the scene just to be able to put some protection around the captain to allow him to have some time to prepare himself for, for a game of cricket. You played through that time, Greg, of that, Huge change, World Series cricket, the first one day is, and the game is still evolving today. How do we, how do we juggle the 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 importance of tradition in the game of cricket, but with this need for innovation in the modern era? Yeah, it's a very important uh, point that you make um, because it's it's hugely demanding as an administrator as well. You know, the the game has changed enormously. But you know, I grew up dreaming of playing Test cricket. It was played in sunlight, in cream clothing, with a red ball and white side screens. And then all of a sudden, during World Series cricket, we started playing night cricket uh, in coloured clothing with uh, white balls and black side screens. Helmets came into being. You know, the, 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 j- the game changed very quickly. You know, the, the change in two years from the start to the end of World Series cricket was probably as great as the change that had been in the 50 years prior to that. So there was a lot of um, scrambling from players, from administrators to try and, you know, make sense of it all. And I can remember the the dramas and, and, you know, I was heavily involved in the dramas around programming at that time because all of a sudden we had two touring teams and we were playing, you know, concurrent test series with England and the West Indies. We'd play the first test against England, second test against the West Indies. We'd throw in a couple of one-day games, then we'd come back to a test against England, then another test against the West Indies, a few one-day games. It was tremendously challenging for everybody, and not least of all the players. And again, as captain, I was right in the middle of it all and was was juggling a lot of stuff off the, off the field that had you know, never happened before. But what we saw with the introduction of uh, one-day cricket, then you know, day-night cricket, particularly for one-day cricket, was a new generation of cricket lovers grew out of, you know, obviously it was very fortunate that World Series cricket coincided with colour television. I think that had a huge impact. If World Series cricket had happened when black and white television was around, it wouldn't have had the impact that it had. But, you know, Kerry understood sport better than anyone and how it worked on television. And all of a sudden, you know, instead of being a distant speck on a black and white screen, um, we were right up close on, on colour television in everyone's lounge room. So the, the focus on the cricket became even even greater. And the, the adaption that had to be made was, was huge. But as I say, the new generation came, a lot of women and a lot of kids started watching cricket because of one-day cricket, coloured clothing, day-night cricket. And a lot of those people then stopped and took time to notice test cricket. And because test cricket up until the early 70s was slowly dying, and I think 
you know, we, we had a bit of success for the Australian team during the, the early to mid 70s and that gave Test cricket a bit of a boost. But, you know, I, I think the, the boost that one day cricket gave the game generally was, was fantastic. And I think 20 over cricket is doing the same thing, to be honest. Um, it's a huge challenge managing three formats. It's a huge challenge for the players, but it's a huge challenge for the administrators. And, you know, I, I think those of us who grew up only knowing Test cricket worry about the future of, of Test cricket. But, you know, I don't know that we need to worry overly because I think, you know, the 2020 cricket has brought a lot of people to the game and a lot of those people will um, start to take notice of Test cricket. And that, that last Test match at Leeds, you know, the interest in that this current Ashes Test series is huge, um, you know, because it's been, you know, there have been some exciting cricket matches. But I think just because there are more people watching the game, they may be not going to the ground in such huge numbers in some parts of the world, but there are more people watching cricket than ever before. And so I think whilst the challenges are there, most of it's positive for cricket. Well, Greg, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it, especially noting how busy you are in the middle of an Ashes series. So uh, I really just uh, thank you for taking the time to share uh, your reminiscences with it. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Matt, and it's been a pleasure. 